Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we will be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to people who live and work there. That's why we are honored to have our guest on today. She is a third term counselor for the city of Coquitlam in the province of British Columbia. Please welcome Councillor Terry Towner. Terry, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. So I want to start with my very first question that I've asked every single municipal politician, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know what? I answer that question the same way every time. It, I was just born with a ton of energy. So even as a teenager, I was involved in student council and volunteering for everything, played every sport, worked part time. And I just I had lots of energy and any free time I had, I just filled it with volunteering at you know the seniors home or helping out wherever I could. And that's just stuck with me. I've never been someone, I didn't even learn how to play Netflix until the pandemic. And I just, I just put my energy to um, my family, of course, and, and whatnot, but then to serving my community. So it just, I like to make a difference. I'm, I like to be part of the, the solution. And I've just, just kind of in my DNA. So where in your DNA does the desire to run for politics come from? Was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or were you the odd entity in the family and decided to put your name forward after in 2014 for municipal council? So no, being a quote politician is definitely not in my DNA. I actually still don't use that word. If you look on any of my social media, it says community and I go by an elected official or sometimes a community minded elected official. I don't, there's a lot of negativity around the word politician and I do everything I can to prove to people that not all politicians are, you know, lying, cheating, conniving, backroom dealing people. It, a lot of quote politicians simply elevate their community service to that in these kind of roles to simply serve their communities. And, uh, that that's just where it came from for me I I was asked to run for council and the opportunity was there and I got talked into it and uh, here I am <laughs> so what was it in 2014 what was were you not doing anything at the time and that's why you got talked into it or was there an issue that people said you know what Terry would be the perfect person to put on council to ensure that our voices are being heard uh, kind of. So it's, I'll try not to make this too long of a story, but I had an amazing career with a public utility in human resources. I had a, I got my business degree with a focus on human resources. I love people. And I had an amazing career for 17 years. And um, unfortunately, one day in 2011, I was reorganized out of my job and I was given very, you know, generous severance and fair and my kids were still fairly young. So I just thought I'll take a couple of years off. But as I said earlier, I've always had lots of energy. So I was really involved in tons of community initiatives. And I've also, I also served, I only have two kids, but I served on 19 PACs, 19 parent advisory councils from kindergarten all the way through to my youngest graduating from grade 12. So I was kind of out and about in the community, always taking pictures for the paper or serving or driving people home for the Safe Ride Home program at Christmas or you know, collecting food for the food bank or just this, that, and the other thing. And people knew me just from being out and about. And then in 2013, two female, I don't know if gender is relevant, but two female city councillors, actually the only two, were elected as MLAs provincially. So there was two out of eight city council seats vacant. So there was a by-election in 2013 and by then I was working for a nonprofit society that I'd been volunteering for for five years. And I was asked if I would consider running to fill one of those vacant seats. 
And at first I said, no, I'm not a politician. <laughs> and in Coquitlam, we're the largest city in BC that doesn't have parties at the uh, council table. So really? There's no, really. There's huh. no parties. There's no slates. There's no parties. We are independent. Yeah. And so when I said, oh, I'm not a politician. And people said, but you love to serve your community. You're a people person. You know, you're fairly well-spoken. You know, you know the city, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you just think about it? So I did think about it. And I also have a philosophy in life that, you know, you got to go to your comfort zone every now and then to that's where the good stuff really is. If we just stay unscared and don't do anything scary or out of our comfort zone, then I've learned that it's great to kind of kick that comfort zone aside and go for it. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it was way out of my comfort zone. I ran in the by-election of 2013 and I did not get elected, but I learned I can do all candidates meetings and I loved door knocking and actually hearing from residents what they loved about our city, what they had concerns about, you know, some people very special interest, we need more ice rinks, we need more tennis courts, that kind of thing. And I loved it, it energized me. So for the next year, until the 2014 general election, I watched or attended every council meeting and I got really up to date on all the issues. And then I ran in 2014 and I think there was 19 or 20 candidates and I came fifth. So I didn't get in in the by-election, but then I came in solid handily in the general and the rest, as I say, is history. And I love what I do. I still don't use the word politician, <laughs> but I love what I do. So there's a few things I want to unpack in that statement that you just gave there. I want to go back to that 2013 by-election for a second here. Because we always remember the first time we see your name on a ballot and you go into a ballot box and you see your name. All the hard work of a campaign gets completely pushed aside because at that moment, you don't know what's going to happen. You get to put your name beside that ballot, uh, your check mark beside your name, and that's it. What was that experience like for yourself to go into that ballot box and vote for yourself? And do you still get that same feeling every time? Yeah, it's hard to explain it. I feel it's kind of surreal because like I thought I would be working at the public utility until I retired. I had loved my job. I had a really good job. And uh, the fact that I'm now doing this is a little, even though I'm in my ninth year now, it is a little bit surreal, you know, but I tick that box proudly and um, don't take democracy for granted. I, I wish voter turnout was higher. Um, I think we all I wish, do. <laughs> yeah, I think we, a lot of people, and I don't really judge people for this, but I think Canadians, we take a lot of things for granted, clean water and safe cities and, you know, democracy. And I, I, I've started asking people just in the last campaign when I would door knock and they would say, oh, it's okay, save your breath, I don't vote. And I would just say, okay, well, thank you. Can I just ask you, um, why is it that you don't vote? Oh, you know what? My garbage gets picked up. I love the parks. I feel safe. I'm happy. So I just don't vote. And I, I kind of explained to them, okay, thank you for your honesty. But just so you know, you kind of have to vote to keep the people in office that you think are keeping you happy and running the city the way that you're satisfied with. Oh, so I've learned that there is a bit of an understanding out there that you only vote when you're mad or when you want change. So the fact that we only had 20% voter turnout last time, which was low, kind of it's either people are super disengaged or the optimist in me is people are happy. <laughs> but that 20% is not just indicative of Coquitlam because across the provinces, it was low in British Columbia in 2022, was it not? Yeah, and then just locally in different cities in the metro Vancouver region, the higher rates of voter turnout were in the cities where there was, um, where it was disruptive, where they where they were where there was some like heavy handed um, dysfunction, issues, dysfunction, dysfunction, and issues and whatnot, and the the voter turnouts were higher, significantly higher. I, I, so I, I want to go back to that campaign though, that 2013-2014 campaigns. 
you you pride yourself on being someone who has the pulse of their community. You were on 19 packs, which seems like a very lot of work for a volunteerism, but here we are. When you were out door knocking, though, you 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 must have heard some macro issues, the high level issues, like we want better services, we want more uh, uh, garbage picks up, we want better access to so and so. But when you were door knocking, did you hear issues that you went, wow, even me, who's so connected to our community, I didn't think this would be an issue that I'd be talking about at the doorstep, but I'm glad someone was. Or was it all high level? You know, there, there's, so uh, that's a, okay. What I've known, what I've learned over my three, I've done four campaigns now, 2013 and then 14, 18 and 2022. Back in 2013 and 2014, I would say that the conversations at the doorstep were more focused on the city the city like oh we really need a crosswalk down the road from me like very micro people in their own neighborhoods yeah. oh we have renters next door and they they smoke marijuana on their deck can you guys do anything about that like very very micro but now especially since covid and black lives matter and the the you know the indigenous children's remains found people are the world has changed and I find that the conversations at the doorstep now, 90% of them aren't really strictly city related issues anymore. They're societal and our, the city governments are having to, rather than focus on roads, rec centers, libraries, garbage, police fire, we're getting more into the social issues and, um, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion and reconciliation and addressing the affordability crisis so just in my short term there time on council it i think i'm i think i'm answering your question but yeah. there's some micro concerns but, but now overall, I find it's yeah it's 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 yes we still get emails about we want more pickleball courts and more ice rinks i don't want to take my kid to 5 30 a.m hockey practice and you know that kind of stuff and um but I'm finding that the world has changed with regards to the higher level issues, which really aren't in a city mandate. Um, I'm proud of Coquitlam that we actually budgeted, was it last year or the year before, a manager to oversee intergovernmental relations and wow. reconciliation and looking at things with a lens. You know, Co Coquitlam is actually the, I guess, the, the white person's pronunciation of Quaquitlam, and I probably haven't even said that right. We have a the Quaquitlam Indian, um, it's called the Indian Band, Indigenous Band on our, in Coquitlam. And it means red fish up the river. And so we have an Indigenous community in our borders and we have really good relations with them. So I think we took a leadership role to really increase that and look at everything through in reconciliation lens, which I'm proud of. And same with the EDI stuff we took a lot of flack for hiring two new manager positions coming out of covid you know with you know businesses struggling and affordability and all that especially in metro vancouver i'm sure you've heard that housing is really expensive here so times have changed and i think coquitlam is doing a good job addressing the societal demands that our residents have within a city mandate and within the tools and resources that we have. We're going to talk about the city here in a few seconds, but I want to go back to you for a second, because in 2014, you were elected for your first term. The blue check mark goes beside your name. You are officially councillor elect as much as you probably don't like the title politician, but you are now officially a politician and you are a councillor elect. How long does it take from the excitement of I've done it, I've got it elected to, oh, God, what have I gotten into? Because now the decisions you're about to make at council not only affect your family, but your neighbors and your community. And if you make the wrong decision, people's lives, people's uh, financial situations could be impacted. How long does that honeymoon period last for you in that 2014 election? To be honest with you, it, the honeymoon period hasn't ever faded. Really? Everything has wow. changed so much. 
the first, the first public hearing that I went to, for the big public hearing we had in 2015, we just got SkyTrain, which is the rapid transit line. Yeah. And a planning principle is that you densify close to rapid transit. Towers and density goes really close to rapid transit. And then you taper down from towers to low rise to townhouses, to single family homes as you move away. It's a planning principle. However, only eight years ago, people didn't want density. They, they didn't, the SkyTrain came and they didn't want it. And the, the, the public hearings of people speaking out against these towers were, were hours long. Like we're talking tons and tons and tons and tons of people speaking against it. Now, we had a public hearing Monday night for a dense proposal, 51 story towers within a couple hundred meters of a SkyTrain station. I think 54 people um, spoke, two were against it, and two just had concerns about traffic. And then all the emails we got were supporting it because now people realize, okay, it's a proper land use to put density next to transit, get people out of their cars, and we have no land left. And immigration is skyrocketing. Our population is growing. We need more housing. We have no land, so we have to use the sky. So because the issues are always changing, um, residents' attitudes and knowledge and concerns are constantly changing, it seems like. Um, the, the honeymoon, I'm, I'm excited now about the new things that we're focusing on. And I, yeah, we've had to make some really tough decisions and yes I have been unfriended and on Facebook and harassed on Twitter and yelled at in the grocery store but because I made the wrong the people didn't agree with my choice but I always give a speech when I know it's tough and I, I just really hope that people will understand why I supported or didn't support something and a lot of times I've found out that people come around there was one woman who was against the against density, against townhouses. It should be single family homes, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 against it. And then two years later, she spoke. She got her neighbors to spoke, all her church friends to, to write in. And then two years later, she phoned me up and said, I'm realizing now that my adult children have nowhere to live. We need townhouses and apartments. And now she was advocating for people to go to public hearings to speak in favor of wow. non-single family home development. So, you know, it, it like it, it just not, Coquitlam is growing so quickly. We're just barely outside Vancouver and it's um so the honeymoon really I haven't been bored. I haven't been well, that's awesome. there's some stress there's some stressful parts, yes. I don't like getting yelled at when I'm at the grocery store. That's only happened a couple of times. Um and I knew going into this that I wasn't gonna make all people happy all the time. Right. So you, you, you mentioned a word here that I want to pick up on here for a second, and I was not going to mention it, but you mentioned the word harassment. Um, in the last few years, local leaders have starting are starting to see the harassment that provincial and federal politicians have been seeing for a long time. In your time in office, has the harassment gotten worse or has it just stayed the same in your opinion? And I'm just, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. It's just, you you mentioned it and I just want to know because we we want to combat that harassment and abuse that local leaders have. And I just want to know, has it been getting worse since you first got elected in 2014? It, it hasn't been getting worse for me personally, but anecdotally, I do believe it's getting worse, but, and this might make me look bad to anybody listening. I did remove myself from a whole bunch of Facebook community groups because the ignorance, the, the, the fake accounts, people would just write anything and they would tag you. And there's nothing worse when you're, you know, just getting into bed for the night and your phone beeps and you pick up your phone and you've been tagged in something and it's super ignorant. And then it affects your own, it's hard to sleep and you just feel attacked and it's not, it's not even correct information. Um, so I, is there I a lot of misinformation my... in municipal politics out in uh, Coquitlam? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there is. Okay. And there's just I'm hearing that a people... lot right now. And there, there's some people who, okay, I'll give you one example. Just me and the mayor. I don't know why I got an email from a lady just really angry tore a strip off us for, because her nephew 
broke his arm and had to wait six hours at the emergency room at Eagle Ridge Hospital. No, 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 you guys don't know what you're doing and blah, 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 and I'm never gonna vote for you again and blah, 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 really, really angry. There was some colorful words. So the mayor wrote her back and said, thank you for your email. I'm really sorry to hear about your nephew, but just so you know, Eagle Ridge Hospital is in Port Moody, not Coquitlam, but don't email the Port Moody City Council because hospitals are provincial and they're run by Fraser Health and they're provincial. So sorry about the wait, but if you have concerns with the, the service or the level of care at the hospital, please contact your MLA about you know the minister, the minister of Health. She wrote back, she didn't care. She just wanted to be angry. And while she had our attention, she complained about other things and they weren't um, civic either. So- but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna push back on that statement here for a second, uh, Terry, because I, I because you are elected as the local council, but people will come to yes. you with provincial issues, with school issues, with federal issues. They don't care what level of government it is. They want you That's to what fix I it. To say. Yeah, they want you to yeah. fix it. How much of your job as a local government, because this 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 is a reoccurring theme right now, is dealing with provincial, federal, and other level governments that have nothing to do with local government? Well, first of all, I can't tell another level of government how to do their job. Like, I would never phone up the hospital and say, I don't like the brand of mammogram machines you have. Please change them. Like, I have no say in anything that the provincial government does. But you can but, contact your MLA or your MP. And I have. I got a you know an anti-idling bylaw put in in Coquitlam because there was people that would weren't allowed to smoke in their basement suites. So they would sit in their car and smoke to stay warm and fill up the neighborhood with fumes. So, you, you know, cities can't just put bylaws in. They got to go through the province. So, I mean, we do advocate and we push for new schools and, you know, we, we push for opioid addiction treatment and mental health treatment. I would say a huge percentage of my job, of our job as a council is advocacy to the school board, the province, the feds. Um, but yeah, you're right. So basically people don't care. They just see me as someone elected and they aren't happy with immigration levels or airplanes flying over Coquitlam on their way to the Vancouver airport, or they want more school. I don't like portables on the school site. You know, none of that is a city, but we, we do, we forward the emails or we write emails or we just, send the concern over and we do advocate a lot for residents so you know I they don't want to hear anybody they don't want to hear anybody push passing the buck but i have no i can't say to someone okay well the next time your nephew breaks their arm i guarantee you that you'll have to wait less i can't i can't say that I, I want to turn to segment two here because I could, I could, I feel like I could talk to you just about segment one for like a good three hours, Terry, because you're just, you're just that personable. But I want to turn to segment two, and that is the city as a whole. And before I start this, I want to preface this and I want to make sure I spell it out because we get emails on a regular basis about this. This is a conversation from the councillor and I's perspective. This is an opinion of the councillor. This is not a motion at council. This is not a direction of council. This is the councillor's opinion. So, Terry, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Coquitlam today? Ah, well, I would say the city of Coquitlam's biggest issue is affordability. But that isn't really a city of Coquitlam specific issue. That's a BC or Metro Vancouver issue. The housing here is super expensive. Gas, Alberta, you're in Alberta, right? Calgary, Gas yep. is super expensive. Our car insurance is super expensive. Groceries have gone up. Um, but but above that, our single concern is housing. Housing, housing, housing. So I just attended a forum last week. Census Canada presented, Stats Canada presented from the 2021 census. Immigration numbers for this year are 430,000, next year 460,000, 2025 500,000. And of those immigrants, the vast majority choose Greater Toronto and Metro Vancouver. And people choose Coquitlam. We're growing like crazy. We have 12,000 
just 12,000 rental units in stream, never mind market and single family. And we have tens of thousands of housing built or in stream. It's not enough. So, so how, how is council trying to address that issue then? How is council and yourself addressing housing, that? We adopted a housing affordability strategy back in 2015 to incentivize developers to build the types of housing that our city needs, you know, the missing middle, to partner with BC Housing, who does like the non-market, the subsidized housing, to, you know, CMHC, to work with the partners to get more affordable housing in. And, you know, so even renters can live here. We need baristas and gas station attendants. We need people who can live here and go to school and work. And, you know, not everybody just gets a, out of high school and has a 60000 a year paying job. So we want a city where everybody can work and live and thrive. So and our, our um, housing affordability plan, we've tweaked it over the years. Our strategy has been exceptionally successful. And tons of other cities are following our lead about in giving developers more density if they'll put in non-market housing and, and, and more seniors housing and stuff like that. So it's working. We're, part, we're really good with partnering with the nonprofits and the province and the city and um, developers put money into the affordable housing reserve fund. And then we use that money to help fund more affordable churches with lots of land are coming to us. And then we, you know, their big surface parking lots, building seniors housing or low income affordable housing on their land and having a smaller church and a smaller parking lot and going underground for their parking. And we're getting really creative and it's working. So, so that's one thing we're doing. I want to I want to follow up on that though because this is an issue that you can only you you have to like you said at the beginning of this you have to build up you could you only have enough land in your area that you can't grow anymore so you have to start growing up. You said you brought in this affordability plan in 2015. COVID nineteen hit. How has the plan been working out? Because you, we are now nine, almost eight years after this plan was introduced. Uh, how's the plan going? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel where people of uh, the city of Coquitlam can say, okay, house prices are semi falling down. They're not as good as we want them, but we're seeing a light here. Or is it still a challenge right now? Well, let's just say in 40 years, before this, nobody built rental in 40 years because the federal government, whose responsibility is affordable housing, pulled out the, pl the plan, the programs. They pulled out. So and there was no new rental built in Coquitlam in 40 years. And now, since 2015, we have, is it 12,000 or 18,000 units in street, either built or in stream? We had 5,200. I'm assuming that's not another... enough still, right? I'm assuming there no. still needs to be a lot more. Because of immigration and people are living longer. So then there's, you know, people who are widowed and they, you know, want to sell their single family home and move into something. So, yeah, no, it, there's not enough. But we have a labor shortage now. <laughs> Construction. Um, there's cranes everywhere. You drive around Metro Vancouver and you just see cranes and construction. Traffic is horrendous because there's so much construction. And apparently what I learned at that uh, census forum last week, the you know, they do comparisons to other GE countries or something. And we need a thousand and twenty five new homes per. I, I shouldn't I don't have them in front of me, but we can't keep up. Canada can't keep up. So we're Coquitlam is doing way more than our neighbors as far as building housing. And we don't build hardly any single family homes anymore because you need a couple million bucks to buy one. We do townhousing, <laughs> wood frame. Yeah, my, I live in a 1957 single family home it's a decent house but my, I got it assessed a few months ago it was 1.9 million I paid 289,000 for it like, that's how expensive homes are here so hey well plan to move to BC has been put on the back burner for a while yeah BC means bring cash right it's um I love how it's honest fine. you are. I honestly love how honest and down to earth you are. You seem like you're no holds bar. Just tell it like it is. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but this is the truth. I'd rather, I'd rather tell you the truth than BS you for a week. Well, but it is the truth though. These are the facts. I'm just telling the facts, the numbers, yeah. immigration, 
lots of immigrants come and they can afford to buy a $2 million house. Like they're economic immigrants, but lots aren't. And my own kids, I don't know how they're going to stay. I have a 21 year old and a 19 year old. I don't know how, where they're going to live. They might be moving to Alberta. <laughs> Welcome them with open arms. Um, exactly. I want to, I want to ask the, 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 the flip side to that question that I started off with is you uh, are, elected to represent the city you have issues that you believe are the most pressing to the city of coquitlam today but if i go to your city tomorrow and i ask a hundred people what their biggest issue is they're going to give me specific issues how do you as counselor address the needs of the many so need to fix affordable housing with the needs of the individual because you need to look at the individual who's elected you and also address those issues as well and not forget about those micro whether it be a park upgrade whether it be parking bylaw changes how do you balance that in a city like Coquitlam when it sounds like and I'm not trying to generalize here the biggest issue is that you guys are going through right now is the affordability issue. So how do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few? You know what? One thing I always try to keep in mind is yes, we're growing and yes, we have to build a city that is livable and affordable and welcoming and for the people that will be coming, but we have to keep it vibrant and healthy and livable and connected for the people that already live here. Is so, there NIMBYism in your community? Not anymore. Okay. Like I said, the the public hearings before were lined up after line up and email after email. And now people are like, keep up the good work, keep building housing. And then we have no NIMBYism. Riverview Hospital is a big 244 acre piece of property that was like the, the, back in the day, it was referred to as the, you know, the insane asylum, the mental health hospital. We have no NIMBYism with regards to mental health treatment. So when we advocate for more mental health beds and opioid addiction treatment, and the BC government just built two huge hospitals on the land to treat the severely addicted and mentally ill, and our community welcomed it. We didn't get any NIMBYism because it's like, that's what the Riverview lands are for. And people just seem to get it now that we need we need to change. We need to adapt to the times and quit building huge houses on big lots and densify so yeah there are some people that don't like change right but generally speaking i would say no we're not a nimbyism city anymore and going back to the original question about balancing the need going back to the original question because i i apologize for interrupting there how do you balance those that that need because individual needs are also important because everyone believes their issue is the most important issue that the city needs to address right now so how do you do it that's one of my favorite parts of the job. Someone will email me and say, Terry, there's a bus stop outside my house and people litter their stuff. I really want a garbage can installed at the bus stop. And so I'll get it installed. Or people will be, you know, there's a little piece of vacant land right here. Can we just put a, a couple of community garden plots so we can grow veggies? And, you know, the, the, the crosswalk down my street, the, the stripes are getting kind of faded can we get those repainted and I love solving those so the little micro things or we take our kids to the kit the, the bike park where they can ride the ramps and jump around but there's nowhere to sit so can you put a bench in so we don't have to bring our fold-up lawn chairs and you know little things like that and I love addressing those micro issues that really make life better for the residents as far we have to still do the big stuff right um, hire police officers, plan neighborhoods and build. But we, you know, it's the the small things that, um, so I just try to take one issue at a time, do my best to resolve it for that person. Someone might say, you know, we really need more ice rinks. Well, I can't really just say, okay, I'll build, we'll get another ice rink. We can't do that. But I love, I love all the little micro the things. And it's it really, it's listening to everybody. Yes, we hear you that we need more pickleball courts. We are working on it. We hear you that we need more, more you know, bylaw officers in the park for dog off leash time because people aren't honoring the board boundaries. And, you know, we, I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. but it's one, one resident at a time, listen to them, acknowledge it and do what you can to address it. 
understandable or tell them what you are understandable that you 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 like addressing the small issues which everyone does because those are the quick wins those are the wins you're like yes i feel good that i got something accomplished because local government can sometimes move at a snail's pace but sometimes (laughs) you will have to say no to people and i'm assuming after nine years or eight years on council you've learned that sometimes like you said that person who says i think we need a new arena in this section of the city well, I would love to, but that means your taxes are going to go X amount, up a, X amount of dollars if you want to pay for it. And does everyone want that? No. So how do you balance that no aspect of a job like yours? Because as elected officials, you have to get reelected in four years or you no longer have a job. So you, you try not to say no to a lot of people. How do you look at issues where you know it's impossible to do but you still have to take the time to listen to the people who have those issues. You know, I listen and I agree with them. I agree that we would, we would, it would be great to have more covered tennis courts because it rains a lot here. I agree that having more ice rinks would be amazing. So little Johnny doesn't have to get up at five 30 on Friday mornings to go to hockey practice. I agree. So I listen to them and I acknowledge it. And then I just, I show them our, our, Uh, we are building new ice rinks we are building more tennis courts and I kind of show them that yes we know our population is growing and this is what we're working on and you know we just opened a big huge beautiful YMCA we're building a new rec center a huge one with a pool up on um, Burke Mountain which is the last greenfield development this side of the river Um, so yeah and we we made some tough decisions where we realized that curling didn't have that many people in it um i think 238 people in coquitlam were curling and um we got rid of it and we consolidated it with the port moody curling ring that was huge and that was affecting our senior population mostly and they vote right and they have spouses and friends and that was a huge so, but sometimes we have to say no and reallocate the use of an asset differently. There was more demand to use the ice for hockey and skating. So I, I don't know. I'm just, like you said, I, I say it like it is. I listen. I acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And then I tell them what we're doing to address it. And it might be two years away or three years away, but it's coming. I or I tr- just tell them if it, if it isn't coming. <laughs> I want to turn to our last segment because I am cautious of time and I know you are a busy counselor. So I want to turn to my favorite subject on this series and that's tourism. I love tourism. I love visiting communities. If you come on my show, I'm going to be in your community this year. So get ready to see the cross border interviews in the city of Coquitlam later on this year. So Terry, as someone who has listeners from across Canada and around the world and myself, what are some of the hidden gems in the city of Coquitlam that you need to check out if you're a tourist coming to your community? Well, it depends what kind of tourist you are, but Coquitlam is surrounded by mountains. We have rivers, forests, lakes, lots of a beautiful trail network, gorgeous parks. We back onto a provincial park and um, we our green space is absolutely stunning. So, if I were a tourist wanting coming here, I would definitely go on some hikes, take in some views, walk along the river, um, go you know feed the ducks at the lake, that kind of thing. We have a Coquitlam Crunch, which is a really popular trail. It's up a mountain that's on a BC Hydro right of way, which is the electrical utility in BC here, and it's 454 stairs followed by, you know, a couple hundred more meters of hiking up to the top and then back down. And um, it, during COVID, I think 60,000 people a month were using the crunch. So it's not really hidden, <laughs> but it's very popular. It's one of the top reasons why people come to Coquitlam. And there's a brewery close, close by. So you do the crunch on a summer evening and then go have a nice cold beer. Um, but I would say, and we have abundant um, mountain biking trails in the mountains as well. So we're known for that. But we also have a theater and a downtown core and, you know, brewery and restaurants and casino for people that are less outdoorsy and want to just take in some some nightlife. 
What about yourself? Where do you go? Where do you go to decompress after a stressful day at council or a stressful public hearing? And before you say it, because every counselor wants to say this, you can't say your house. You have to say somewhere in your community, not your own house, because we all want to escape there. Where do you go yeah. in the community, Terry? Well, the really stressful council meetings don't end till after midnight because we don't start till we start at 2 p.m. And then we go all day and then our regular council meetings start at 7 I mean, I didn't get home until 1130 Monday night. So I don't really go. I can't go to the green spaces after council. However, I am one of those people that does escape to the green spaces, the hiking and the I, I mean, I went running this morning, even though it snowed here along the Coquitlam River, did a 5K run with my spikes on my shoes in the forest. It was beautiful. Nobody was there. It was quiet. But I really want to take this opportunity to tell you that during COVID, I learned of an app called City Strides, and it syncs your running app to the, the streets in your city. And I took it upon myself, and I ran every meter of every street in Coquitlam in 2020. And then I ran all of Port Moody and more Belcara and Port Coquitlam. It was 2,200 kilometers of running, tons of hills, five pairs of running shoes, and uh, I absolutely loved doing it. And I really learned so much more about my city and it reinvigorated my passion for my city because a lot of Coquitlam is urban, high density, rapid transit, towers, you know, restaurants and vibrancy. But we also have blueberry farms and bears uh, right next to the river and then mansions and mobile home parks and everything in between. And the green space. And so I just fell in love with my city again, the diversity of it, the diversity of the neighborhoods, the diversity of the terrain and the topography. So I, I, so I just want to make I sure love, city like, strides is what it's called. Yeah. If you Google me, just Terry Towner run every street, you'll see articles because people saw my tweets and I got interviewed and got some media coverage, even though that's not why I did it, but yeah, you can, log on to city strides and it it turns the streets purple and i have an amazing poster hung up in my office now that a friend made for me that's the map of the tri cities which is the five the two villages and the three cities where every street is purple where i ran and you can see the you know the cul-de-sac i ran every cul-de-sac in a circle and you can see it all that it's actually really cool awesome um yeah, it was kind of cool because the radio had me on and then people who were listening, my my phone and my email exploded after people from all over BC heard and wanted to learn what this app was. And I've heard back from people now months later saying they walked every street in their city or they ran every street. And I kind of got people out doing it. It was a, a, a good thing to do during the pandemic. Well, I will link that app in the show notes for anyone who wants to get it because I, I'm going to download that because I think it'd be fun. But I want to... Okay. As far as I know, it's still a web-based app. So okay. it's, not an app, it's not an app for say on your phone. You have to use Strava or Runkeeper to keep track of your runs and you link it to City Strides. But Okay. Well, the link the, the link will be in the show notes. But I want to end on this note, uh, Terry. And this is the most important question that I probably will have asked every counselor, and you're no exception. And take as long as you want to answer this question. In your opinion, what makes city of Coquitlam such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I would say Coquitlam is unique in that it does have that vast array that I just alluded to. Lots of urban, but then also lots of really amazing, beautiful, quiet, green space. But we're also very, very diverse. I think 58% of our residents speak a different language. Um, we have a huge diversity, like I said, diversity of neighborhoods, diversity of housing, diversity of topography, diversity of people. I don't know if that's unique because I think most of Metro Vancouver is like that, but we're just a, a very vibrant, welcoming place to raise a family. It's very family friendly, senior friendly, I don't know I, what's unique about Coquitlam. I, I would just say it's it's diversity. Um, the world lives here. 
And that is awesome. Um, Terry, I want to thank you so much. The last 45 minutes have flown by. It doesn't even feel like yeah. we've just got it started, but here we are 45 minutes into this. And I want to take a moment and say thank you from the bottom of my heart for just randomly answering my message on social media one day and saying, yes, sure. I'll come on your show. It's always great when I get uh, random uh, counselors who uh, just say yes to me. And I, I like it when they don't say no, I'm like a voter for God's sakes. So <laughs> So, Terry, the town, the city of Coquitlam is better served with you at the council table. I wish you all the best. And I look forward to meeting you, hopefully in person, when I visit the city of Coquitlam later this year. You know what, Chris? When you, If you do come to Coquitlam, look me up. I would love to uh, meet you. We'll go you and grab a coffee. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I love my city, and I'd be honored to show you a, a, hidden, a hidden gem. Awesome. So with that, I want to remind everyone, get off social media for at least five to 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.